Hey guys, guys, it's Sarah. So this is the NCLEX RN ATI Comprehensive Review Series. So this is section 6H in which we're going to go over the genital urinary system and disorders. So last time we were talking about the cardiac system, which was 6G, and the last part of the cardiac system is an EKG part. I'm going to link the video up to here. I didn't make it specifically for ATI because there are other people who also wanted it that were just studying for the NCLEX. So I'm going to link it on the top. And just click on it and you can watch the video of EKG rhythms because that's part of the cardiac system. Here are some section 9 genital urinary disorders. First we're going to have a little recap about the kidney to better understand the disorder. Here are a few functions of the kidney. It regulates acid base, it regulates fluids and electrolytes, it regulates the blood pressure, and secretes erythropoietin, and excretes metabolic waste like urea, creatinine. And this is important to know because then you'll understand what it does and what is going to be affected. Specific. Here are some diagnostic tests for genital urinary disorders. Urinalysis. So this is going to test what's in the urine. So it's going to test the specific gravity, the color, to see if the person's dehydrated. You want negative glucose, negative proteins, RBC, WBC, etc. It's also going to be testing the pH, etc. So you want it to be the first void in the morning and you want to refrigerate it after. So other diagnostic tests. Renal function test. This includes BUN, creatinine, 24-hour creatinine clearance, uric acid, and prostate-specific antigen. You can also do radiologic tests like x-rays to see the kidney, the ureters, the bladder. We also have the renal angiography, so you inject the dye and you visualize the renal arteries. We also have the cystoscopy where we put a scope into like bladder and around there to visualize it. We also have a renal biopsy to take a little bit out to test it for cancer, etc. The last one is an indwelling urinary catheterization. This is a sterile procedure that is done. They put a catheter in and it can be done for multiple reasons. To empty the content of the bladder, to get sterile specimen, to bypass obstruction. So for the in dwelling urine a catheterization. Just want to make sure that you maintain a closed system. You're going to measure the INOs every shift, specifically the output. You want to keep the drainage bag below the level of the client's bladder. You want to increase the daily fluid intake and you want to discontinue it as soon as possible because it places the patient at risk for urinary tract infection. Urethral specific genital urinary disorders. So just a, a little recap. Urinary tract infection is any type of infection that is found on the urinary tract. So if it's by the bladder, it could be a bladder infection, which is called cystitis. If it's up in the kidneys, it's a kidney infection called pyelonephritis. If it's by the urethra, it's urethritis. So here we're going to be talking about cystitis, which is what you think when you think of a urinary tract infection. But just remember that a urinary tract infection could also be in the kidneys, etc. So cystitis. So this is inflammation of the bladder. Causes. Causes could be not wiping correctly, so they're wiping from the back to the front. It could be prolonged baths with soap, um, especially for females, BPH, or in a dwelling catheter. Sign and symptoms. They could have urinary frequency, urgency, they have the dysuria with hematuria, they have the bladder pain, fever, chills, cloudy, foul smelling urine, and the urinalysis is going to show it. Interventions. So you want to take a clean catch urine sample. You want them to increase their fluids. They should be drinking cranberries, good for them. You give them medications like antimicrobials. You want them to have good perineal care, like wear cotton underwear, void after sex, and no bowel baths. So just think of your regular urinary tract infection, what you would think of that. The next one is acute glomerulonephritis. This is a disorder of the glomerulite. So basically, think of the blood filtering system. Causes. Causes are strep. Signs and symptoms are hematuria, cola, tea color urine, with protein in the urine. And also edema, oliguria, hypertension, azotemia, which is basically a high level of nitrogen-containing compounds in the urine. So urea, creatinine is high, etc. Intervention. You want to put them on bed rest because of your kidney. You want to restrict the fluids because they have edema. You want to have daily weights and you give them medications like 
antihypertension, if it's increased blood pressure, corticosteroids for the inflammation, or penicillin for the strep. Acute urethrolysis. Now this is also called urinary calculite, which is a kidney stone. Causes. Causes are obstruction, a uric acid stone, so excessive purine intake, and immobilization. Sign and symptom. Pain. It really depends where the location is and the size of the stone. So if it's in the ureters, they're going to have severe renal colic pain. If it's in the kidney, they're going to have dull and aching pain that radiates to the groin. Some other signs and symptoms, they're going to have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or even constipation, hematuria, and regular urinary tract infection signs. Intervention. So first of all, you want to increase the fluids, you want to strain all urine, you want to do pain control, give them medications like opioids and for your acid stone, you would give them allopurinol, and you could do erythrotripsy, which crushes the stone through sound waves, and you want to tell them to avoid oxalates if it's a calcium stone. Chronic acute renal failure. This is a sudden decrease in renal function. So this is acute renal failure, In next slide we're going to be talking about chronic renal failure, and the difference is that acute renal failure is caused by a sudden decrease in renal function, and you could fix the cause and then you get better. Chronic renal failure is when it happens over time. You can't just fix it that easily. Causes for acute renal failure it is divided into three categories, pre-renal, renal, and post-renal. Pre-renal is stuff that are like from above the kidney. So basically anything that causes a decreased blood flow to the kidneys, like hypovolemic shock, heart failure, dehydration, and burns. Renal is another cause, and it's basically anything that happens to kidney damage, either trauma to the kidney or any of those kidney diseases like glomerulonephritis, etc. Post-renal is anything that happens that compromises the urine flow from the kidneys. This includes like kidney stones, BPH, tumors, etc. Signs and symptoms. So the person will go through four stages. The first one is obviously the onset which is when they get it, whatever caused it, hypovolemic shock, etc. Then they're going to go through three more phases. The first one, oliguria. They're going to have a decrease in urine output, so they're going to have edema, elevated BUN, acidosis signs, heart failure signs, etc. Then they're going to go through the diuretic stage, so they're going to keep peeing everything out. So they're going to have hypotension and opposite. Then they're going to go through a recovery stage, so this could take up to a year for them to have their normal, like their baseline kidney function. Interventions. Obviously you want to correct the cause because this is an acute thing, so you correct it and they hopefully get better. So you also want to correct the metabolic acidosis, you want to correct the hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, and hypocalcemia. You want to correct those electrolytes. You want to do a dietary modification. So you're going to put them on a low protein diet, high calorie, restrictive potassium, etc. And you can give them medications like phosphate bonders to lower the, the phosphorus or epigoin to treat anemia depending on what they have. Now we're going to talk chronic kidney failure. This is progressive kidney failure which is irreversible as opposed to acute renal failure which we said before, comes on quickly just from a cause, you treat it, and it's reversible. Risk factors. The main one is diabetes mellitus. Other ones are uncontrolled hypertension, glomerulonephritis, pyelonephritis, chronic kidney disease, it's basically anything that damages the kidney. Signs and symptoms. They're going to have all different ones. They're going to have fatigue because of anemia, headaches, hypertension, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, edema because the kidneys are not working as fast, hypoglycemia, hyperkalemia, pruritus, so they can be itchy, metabolic acidosis, even lead to death and coma. There are different stages. So the stages go from one to five, and the stages are staged by the glomerular filtration rate, the GFR. So stage one is the most mild, so it's that you have a GFR that is greater than 90. And stage 5 is that you have a GFR less than 15, which is end-stage renal failure, ESRD, end-stage renal failure. And the rest are just 
with the numbers in between them. Interventions. So you want to place the patient on a rest. You want to put them on a renal diet. So that's a low protein, low potassium, high carbohydrates, vitamins, calcium supplements, low sodium, and low phosphorus. So basically, all the interventions in general, I've probably said this before, but all the interventions in general, you just look at the signs and symptoms, and those are going to be your interventions. So if you have hypocalcemia as your signs and symptoms, then you want to make sure they get calcium. If you have hyperkalemia as your signs and symptoms, you want to make sure they don't eat high potassium food. And so on. Like if they have itching, you're going to do skin care, etc. So just continue with interventions. You're going to monitor for hypertension strict INOs, you're going to monitor the electrolytes, they're going to need dialysis, in the next slide we're going to discuss all about the dialysis, you give them the diuretics because of edema, skin care because of the itching, and medications. Like we said in the other slide, the phosphate binders and the ipotin alpha to stimulate the red blood cell for anemia. Now we're going to talk about dialysis. So what is dialysis? So dialysis keeps your body in balance by removing the waste, the salt, the extra water to prevent them from building up in the body. Because if you remember, the kidney's main function is to regulate the fluids and electrolytes. So when it doesn't work properly, it's not going to do that. And you're going to have a buildup of waste, etc. So dialysis removes that. There's two different types of dialysis. There's hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. The main difference is that peritoneal dialysis is through the stomach and the hemodialysis is through a vascular access. For the hemodialysis, you want to weigh the patient before and after. You want to monitor the blood pressure continuously the whole time. The main concern about dialysis is a drop in blood pressure because you're removing fluids. You also want to cure to the site of the vascular access. You want to assess for thrills and bruise. You want them to have good nutrition. You have to post a sign on top of their bed that says no blood pressure or blood work on the fistula side. You want, you're going to put them on a fluid restriction and don't give them their morning medication before dialysis. Peritoneal dialysis, as we said, is just through the peritoneum, so the abdominal cavity, to remove the fluid. So the, a catheter is going to be placed surgically in the peritoneum. You want to tell the patient to void before, and you're going to weigh them daily. You want to monitor their vials and electrolytes, asepsis, and sterile dressing. When you're actually doing it, first you're going to warm the dialysis, which is like the dye. You're going to make sure that it flows by gravity, so you're not going to force it by gravity for 5 to 10 minutes. You, then you're going to clamp it, and you're going to let it dwell for 30 minutes. Then you're going to open it and drain it. You want to monitor for complications. Benign kidney transplant. Kidney transplant is for patients with end-stage renal failure. It's the last resort after you do dialysis and nothing else worked. So you're going to need a matched donor. Interventions. So you want to monitor the labs. You want to give them immunosuppressives. You want to monitor the patient for rejection signs, like oliguria, fever, fluid and electrolytes, etc. You want to monitor the patient for infection because they're immunosuppressed, they're at risk for infection, and you're going to place them in protective isolation. You want to give them emotional support. Urinary diversion. So this is the process of removing the bladder and the surrounding the structures to reroute the urine flow through a stoma and opening. Interventions. So you want to monitor the vitals, of course. You want to monitor the stoma. You're going to put them on pain control. And the main complication you want to monitor for is paralytic ileus. You also want to have fluid replacements, you want to take a daily weights, and have a patent drainage tube. Prostate cancer. Benign prostate hypoplasia, BPH. So this is an enlargement of the prostate. It is really common and they don't really know a cause, but it seems to be normal aging process. Signs symptoms. So a decreased force of urination. They're gonna have difficulty starting the stream. Dribbling, frequent UTIs, nocturia, hematuria, etc. This can be diagnosed through 
a GRE, so a digital rectal exam, or cystoscopy. And the definite diagnosis is through prostate-specific antigen. Treatment. Treatment's going to be antibiotics, alpha blockers, enzyme inhibitors, transurethral resection of the prostate, TERP. So this is one, and a large portion of the prostate is removed. Interventions. So you want to insert an indwelling catheter, give antibiotics, you want to monitor for shock and hemorrhage, you want to avoid sitting a long time, heavy lifting, straining, anything that could cause the person to re-bleed. You want a continuous bladder irrigation. You want them to increase the fluid intake. You want to have them on pain control, and you want the catheter to be taped to the patient's leg, and they should be doing Kegel exercises. In prostate cancer. So this is type of cancer, obviously in the prostate, that it's very slow growing. Risk factors. So men over the age of 50, African Americans, family history, elevated testosterone, or high fat diet. Sign and symptoms. So first it's going to be asymptomatic. Then they can have hematuria, elevated prostate specific antigens, and during a rectal exam they're going to find a hard pea-sized nodule and frequent UTIs. So treatment. So there are different options. You could do a radial prostatectomy, you could do external radiation therapy, internal radioactive seeds, or hormonal therapy. The next type of cancer is testicular cancer. So this is really rare. It usually occurs between the ages of 20 and 54. And risk factors are being in that age group for men, family history, and undescended testes. Signs and symptoms. So they're going to have swelling and a painless lump, either on one or both of the testes. Treatment. So treatment's going to be off sperm banking, orchitectomy, which is a surgical removal of one or both of the testes, and chemotherapy. And of course, emotional support because they can't have kids anymore, etc. That's an incontinence. This is a loss of bladder control. There are different types. The first type is urge. This is when they feel like they have to go to the bathroom, but they can't hold the urine in. The next type is functional. This is when they physically cannot get to the bathroom, like a spinal cord injury, etc., or they don't realize they have to go. And the last type is stress. So this is when there's pressure, like either you cough or you put strain or you laugh, and it causes incontinence. Interventions. You could give them adult incontinent devices. You could decrease their fluids after 6 p.m. You want to put them on a regular toileting schedule. Kegel exercises and medications like anticholinergic and TCAs. And the last one is urinary retention. So this is the inability to completely or partially empty the bladder. It is usually caused from a physical obstruction or chronic causes like edema, BPH, a tumor, etc. Intervention. So you want to place the patient upright so it's easier for them to urinate. You want to increase their fluids. You want to stimulate relaxation of the sphincter by giving the patient the privacy, putting the patient's hands in warm water, or even guided imagery. That's it for part 6H. Please stay tuned for part 6I, in which we're going to be talking about the neurosensory disorders. So please like and subscribe, and don't forget to watch the EKG video, which is going to be linked above. Thank you. Good luck.